Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming today. Quite a bit of rain today, huh? I didn't know whether to bring my car or my canoe to get here today. You know, I try to water ski a couple times a week, and so I go out on Monday morning. So I was looking. Uh, when it starts raining, you got to kind of look for times to go. It's 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 uh, it's clear tomorrow from five to eight a.m. So we'll be skiing in the dark, I guess. So. More than 200 years ago, George Washington led a tattered group of colonists, uh, the army, uh, through a series of devastating defeats, uh, through a brutal winter and deep discouragement, to victory against the most mighty military force in the world. Now, how did he do it? I mean, uh, historians will, will point to some of his great leadership qualities, his strategies. Uh, they'll talk about the fact that as a, a young man, he was a surveyor, so he knew, he knew the land very well. But more than anything else, the reason for the victory was that the, col the colonists had a compelling cause. They were fighting for their very lives, for their farms and their families. The British troops didn't have that. They're fighting for King George, who's like thousands of miles away in their homeland. They serve as an... Uh, how did it end up with anybody winning other than Britain? It's because they had a cause. And we see this throughout history. Many times underdogs have defeated mightier foes because they had a reason to fight. You know, think about yourself. If you're fighting for something that involves, you know, your home... Or your family, don't you step up your game? Uh, Erica took a fall uh, some time back and Jory just sprung into action. And I laughed with her afterwards. I says, you know, when any one of our nine kids is in trouble, you, motherhood really kicks in with you. It's the same in the church. A church progresses the cause of Christ moves forward when all believers see that they just have one life to make a difference for Christ. What would happen if we all saw, our, saw ourselves as full-time ministers for Christ everywhere we go? And we took the fullness of Christ to all the places where we go during the week. This is the second in our series of messages called Made for More. Apostle Paul in Ephesians, which is the series is based on, says, which is his body, he's talking about the church, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Paul says the church made up of individual followers of Christ, are to take the fullness of Christ to every place in the world. Uh, sometimes I wonder if when I talk, if people are actually listening. You that were here last week, I mentioned uh, taking the fullness of Christ to every crook and cranny. Any of you remember me saying that? And my family really locked in on that. Like, what was that? You know, it's supposed to be nook and cranny. I was saying, cr so to, to add emphasis, I said it about four times. So last night we were doing our journal and just everybody, every answer, they were saying, you know, yeah, take the fullness of Christ to every crook. And, and I said, no, it's crook and granny. Not, you know, and we were just joking about it the whole night. So they were really locked in on my message last week. Uh, so it's to take Christ to every corner of the world. In Ephesians 2, 
Paul writes, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. We're not saved by our efforts, something we do. It's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We, individual Christians, followers of Christ, are God's handiwork. We're to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Every follower of Christ, Paul says, is a handiwork of God, a masterpiece designed to do good things in the world. The church does its best when it focuses on helping people discover how they're a masterpiece. How God has designed them to make a difference in the world. Now, typical church, the pastors kind of come up with the programs of the church. Yeah, we ought to have a youth program. Yeah, we need a children's program. We need music. We need technology, we, you know, we need ushers, greeters, and you kind of make slots. How many volunteers do you need to make the deal go? Now, a church that's good, that's really on their game, doesn't just put people into slots, but they help people discover their spiritual gifts, what their passions are, and what their story is. And then they serve in the right spot. But when churches get desperate, they need somebody Sunday and they need somebody. They'll just take any warm body. You walk in the church and somebody will jump you and say, can you help in the nursery today? You kind of are looking like, what? Uh, and you know, the kids are cute. You'll do fine. The church is made for more than that. We're to help people discover how God has made them and what he's designed for them to do, their good works in the world, how they can make a difference. Church focus is not on filling slots, but on creating masterpieces. The church is made to move from more volunteers to more masterpieces. I want to talk about three shifts our church can make to move from just getting more volunteers to creating more masterpieces. One, shift from filling volunteer slots to supporting masterpiece mysteries or ministries. <laughs> there I go again. Lock in whenever I goof up today, all right? I talked last week about uh, Home Depot's uh, slogan, you know, you can do it, we can help. And how I have usually been impressed with staff there where I come in, I've got a project, and they help me find what I need to buy and, and even, even help me work through how I'm going to do it. The church can get it backwards. We can do it. You can help. We've got it all figured out. We just need you to sign up for one of our slots. But that's not the way the church is supposed to work. Apostle Paul writes, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people. Does it say to do the work of the ministry? Does he give these people so that they can be on stage and everybody else just watches? No, he says we're to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Now, your masterpiece ministry will always be at the intersection of your spiritual gifts, your passions, and your story. Maybe your story is you went through a divorce. Now you're happily married and your passion is to help people build strong marriages. In Psalm 39, 139, we read, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. 
My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. You know, you can't read this without seeing that life begins at conception. God knew you before you were born, when you were in your mother's womb. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. So God had a plan for us before we were even born. For some of the, your, your design, your masterpiece, how God wanted to use you. Leonce Crump, pastor of Renovation Church, tells about a woman coming to him one Sunday and saying, I want to do foster ministry. And his immediate reaction was, you know, we don't have the bandwidth to do that. We don't have the resources. So he says, we can't do it, but we'll help you. Within a year, she had placed dozens of children in foster care homes. And 11 new foster families were coming to the church. Another woman came to him and says, do you have a special needs ministry? He says, no. But if you tell me how you want to get it done, we will help you. We'll give you all the help and resources we can. She said, nobody has ever told me that before. When we're trying to fill volunteer slots, we're, we give the impression that we're more interested in what we can get from you rather than what we can do for you. It's easy uh, to focus on what we want from you. We want you to attend our church. We want you to serve in some way. We want you to get involved in some community group. We want you to give to the church. All those things are good for you, so I'm, I'm not embarrassed to ask you to do any of those things, but it can give you the impression is that all we care about is what we can get from you. Our focus needs to be on what we can do for you to help you discover your masterpiece ministry, how God has designed you to serve him in this world. Second, and closely related, shift from pastors as ministers to all people as ministers. You talk to most pastors and they will tell you that they feel that they were called by God. At some point in their life, they felt like God was calling them to become a pastor. So it's easy for pastors who feel this special calling from God to kind of just take over. You know, I'm in a special category different from you. Watch me do it. You just sit back. But that's not what pastors are supposed to do. Let me read it again, what Paul says. For so Christ himself gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to do what? To equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Paul's clear that all of us are called to ministry. As pastors, our main job is to help you discover what you're designed by God to do. In Ephesians 2.10, read it again, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So we're all called to do good works. Not just the pastors. And again, Ephesians 1.23, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills every, there it is, crook and cranny. Everything in every way. We're called to take the fullness of Christ to every part of society. Rob Wagner tells about a guy named Andy in his church in Kansas City. Andy was serving in the church. He was actually doing too many things. He was kind of too busy in the church. But he didn't feel like he was really in his sweet spot 
And so it left him kind of frustrated and a little bit purposeless. Then he took a masterpiece discovery. I went through a masterpiece discovery process. The closest thing we have to that is uh, uh, our starting point class. John Witherspoon talked to me a couple weeks ago about he'd like to do something with this, you know, how to help people discover what God's designed them to do and get them launched. So he went through that and it intersected what he learned there with an unwanted assignment he had been given at work. He headed up the HR department for a large nationwide theater chain and he was asked to figure out how we can meaningfully employ people with disabilities. And he kept pushing that assignment off on the corner of his desk and, and then he was uh, meeting with his discipleship group, a group of four guys in his church and, and he... Uh, powerfully, uh, this verse uh, uh, came to him, Proverbs 31, 8 to 9. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. And at that point, that's when he saw that, you know, people with disabilities, they are my people. And he got to work on the assignment and he came up with a way for every theater in their chain to meaningfully employ people with disabilities. He did such a good job that other companies started coming to him like Starbucks and Hobby Lobby and uh, Google and even the White House. And so now he started a new organization and as of today, they've employed 20,000 people with disabilities across the country. Todd Wilson, who wrote the book More, one of the books that Micah ordered for me to start this series, Micah suggested, you know, last spring, why don't you do this series made for more and uh, based on Ephesians. And, and so Todd Wilson tells about Alan Hirsch, uh, a... Uh, He's a missiologist, an author, and he asked him one day, who are you pastoring that's far from God? And Todd looked at him like, what? He says, who are you, where do you go each week where you're with lots of people who don't know Christ? Who are you pastoring? He says, well, I'll go to the gym six times a week. He says, you know, just, just declare yourself pastor of the gym. You don't have to get any permission. You just decide that's what God wants you to do. And as Todd thought about that, it changed his whole thinking. His MO before had been get in the gym, get out, talk to no one as fast as possible. Now he thought about, you know, I need to get to know the staff. I need to actually talk to some other people there. He went all he went the same time every day, so he saw the same people. Another guy in his small group was a judge in a courtroom. And he began seeing himself as pastor of his courtroom. It wasn't like he was going to offer prayers or serve the sacraments, but it changed his whole thinking about how he could make a difference there through his Christian faith. He could have an influence in the courtroom. Where can you see yourself as pastor? Your class at school? Your team? Where you work? Your neighborhood, your family, a club you attend. Third, shift from ministry in the church building to ministry in the world. When we're talking all, about, all the time about serving in worship or with children's ministry or with youth, or with our technology, or men's ministry, or women's ministry, since all of these things occur mostly in the church, it's easy to get the impression that ministry only takes place in the church building. 
But since we're all called to be full-time ministers for Christ everywhere we go, we need to emphasize that ministry doesn't just take place in the church building. I mean, church isn't just the church building. We are the church. We don't go to church. We are Christ's church. We take Christ everywhere we go. Leonce Crump tells about Lecrae Moore coming to his church one day and Lecrae Moore is a well-known Christian rapper and he talked to him and he says, you know, I'm going to help with the youth program. He says, I'm going to serve up on the worship team. I'm going to turn this worship team into the hottest worship team in the, the country. He says, and I'm, someday I'm going to serve on your board. Well, Leanne's watched for some weeks. Months went by and uh, Lecrae was so busy on tour, doing concerts and, you know, uh, that, you know, he didn't have time for that. So one day Leon said to him, you know, you're not going to help in our youth ministry. You're not going to serve on our worship team. And you're not going to be on our board. And you don't need to do any of those things. You can touch people's lives that I will never touch. Where you sing and albums you, you produce, people you work with, that's where God's called you to serve. Could be the same for you. You may not be doing something here, but God's given you ministry wherever you go. You have people at your school, your work, your neighborhood, <clears throat> your family that I will never touch. Are you tracking with me what I'm talking about today? The church is made to move from more volunteers to more masterpieces. Our focus can't be on just getting people to fill in slots. Our attention has to be on helping each one of us discover how God has designed us. What is our masterpiece? How he wants to use us. We need to help people discover their spiritual gifts, their passions, and their story. And out of that, God's going to use each one of us. I believe we're made for more. Made for more in our personal lives and more as a church. So we accomplish more in the Portland metropolitan area. Do you already see yourself as a pastor to people far from God? At your place of work, your school, your club, your neighborhood? When we all see ourselves this way, we'll release the fullness of Christ into every corner of the world. Do you raise your hand if you want to see yourself as a pastor to people far from God this week? Just raise your hand. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word, Ephesians 2, that every one of us is your handiwork. And you have ways designed from when we were conceived in our mother's wombs how you wanted to use us. If we would just turn our lives over to you. We all have our own stories, things we've done and things we're passionate about and ways you've gifted us. Help us to discover that and see how you can help us pastor people, minister to people wherever we go. You want to tell God that you want to be a minister all week long? You want to be a pastor to people far from God this week? Would you tell him that right now? You pray. Lord, we were made for more and we pray that you'd help each one of us discover more in how you want to use us this week. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.